Where should we inject our GLP-1 to get maximum benefit? The three recommended sites are the abdomen, the thigh, and the back of the arm, and it's recommended that we rotate our injection site. Now that doesn't mean we need to go thigh, arm, abdomen. It means we just need to make sure we're moving our needle at whatever site we're using so we're not going through the exact same point every week. A lot of people just stick in one area and just keep moving the needle. If you are using the abdomen, try and avoid stretch marks and inject through intact skin. I would recommend avoiding the thighs if you're somebody who's needle phobic or afraid that the injection will hurt because it can sting a little bit more there. And if you are able to contort yourself to get it into the back of your arm, then I really do applaud you. Strictly speaking, it shouldn't matter where you inject because we're just using the subcutaneous fat to get the medication to where it needs to go. However, Eli Lilly have done a study, but they only did it on 54 people, which begs the question why they did it at all, because this really isn't enough to draw any conclusions. And they were looking at the differences in the bioavailability of the drug at the three sites, depending on where it was injected. So they found that there was slightly more availability of the drug 20 days after injection when using the abdomen. But these are only very small percentage terms and we don't know how much this actually matters, if this would be consistent over a wider population of people, and if these numbers are really enough to make any difference at all. What is interesting from the study though, is that when patients were injecting into the abdomen, they were much more likely to report appetite suppression and also more side effects. So how we can use this is that if you are somebody who's injecting into your abdomen but you're struggling with side effects, maybe try your arm or your thigh. And if you're somebody injecting into your arm or your thigh, but you're not really getting the benefits, you're not getting any appetite suppression and you want that, maybe try injecting into the abdomen. You can try those tweaks before you try changing your dose. If you go on any forums or Mujara groups, you do tend to hear this anecdotally as well, which is why I think it's interesting. A lot of people do say they get maximum benefit, but maximum side effect from the abdomen. So who knows? We don't have the study data really to back this up or refute it. What should be your go-to meals and how important is calorie counting versus calorie counting, but focusing on percentage, fat, carbs, and protein? When you're on these medications and trying to lose weight, being in a calorie deficit is tricky. So then just focusing on protein, that's enough for a lot of people. Particularly if you're new to the medication or you're titrating your dose, you may have significant side effects. And so that is enough to be thinking about. Don't overburden yourself. Don't try to be perfect from day one because it's just not gonna last. The most important thing when it comes to your food is that you enjoy it, you genuinely enjoy it, that you're eating things that are easy for you to access. Just start building up regular habits very slowly that are easy for you to do. Buy in different foods, be prepared to overeat some days, be prepared to get your food wrong some days and work out what works for you. I've spoken to a few people who tell me that they have the perfect diet for a GLP-1 and that's incredible that they found the perfect diet for them. But there is no such thing as a generic perfect diet. The first thing is getting that calorie deficit and get that protein to maintain your muscle mass. Carbs and fat, everyone's going to be different as to what balance works for them. We all know with keto, some people feel great when they do keto, other people feel horrendous on keto. That's because we all metabolize slightly differently and some people like more carbs and some people like more fat. And ultimately you should do what's right for you. But prioritizing protein to maintain that muscle mass, particularly if you're losing weight quite quickly and you're not eating very much, make sure you get that protein in. That's the single biggest thing. But there's no set way you need to do that. Do it in a way that you enjoy. Do it in a way that you enjoy your life. You don't have to get to a certain point with this before you eat food you enjoy. Start enjoying it from the start. I think sometimes in my own dieting, I have aimed to have this really immaculate diet where I eat very similar things every day. I'm quite repetitive, so that works for me. But I like rigidity and actually learning to be more flexible and just let things go a little bit more. So when I started doing a lot of this, I ate a lot of protein and a lot of fat. I didn't eat that many carbs. I have friends who did a similar diet on a GLP-1. The fat was really triggering to them, made them feel awful. So they went higher carb. And then over time, as I've run more now, I want more carbs. So my diet's changed again, but there's no point in me telling you exactly what I've done because that's specific to my journey. And so, it is a case of trial and error and being prepared to get it wrong and being okay with getting it wrong is an important part of your mindset. What should we do if our GP and healthcare team are anti-GLP-1s when our individual healthcare calls out for it? I would change your doctors. Now that might seem pretty harsh or it might be quite tricky to do, but if you have a healthcare need that factually you meet the requirement for a GLP-1, 
that should be an option, that should be a discussion. If that's not a discussion and a doctor's own internal beliefs are getting in the way, I would recommend a different doctor. The reality is I'm not sure how often this is happening. I think definitely in the last few months there's been a big shift here in the UK in a lot of doctors. A lot of people are much more open to these medications. Next week or the week after, I'm doing a whole video about doctors' attitudes towards GLP-1s because I find it so fascinating and I spend a lot of time with lots of different doctors, many of whom perhaps more open to a colleague about some of their viewpoints and some of whom have changed their viewpoints or been more open with me since I've lost weight. And I don't know if they're aware of their own biases or not, but I want to share some of those interesting parts of why some doctors may be less for these medications than others. So that's going to come up. Where are you up to with your clinic? everything is ready to go. It's been ready to go for a little while. I'm just waiting on something called the CQC, which are our regulator here in the UK for healthcare providers. So I need their go ahead. I need to do interviews and things with them. I've had another email from them today. So things are moving along, but I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be. The other possibility is I've had a number of providers reach out to me asking to potentially partner with me to do something. Um, so I'm looking into that at the moment, but I haven't got a date as yet. It is so incredibly frustrating and they can't even give me estimates <laughs> so I'll let you know as soon as anything comes through but until then I'm going to be here and even when it's open I'm still going to be on this channel so I just can't give specific advice to individuals through this channel. Can you tell me how to approach coming off the drug once I reach my target weight so that I don't rebound? I can tell you things that might make it less likely that you'll rebound but we fundamentally do not have the data to say why so many people do. In studies, we know the majority of people will regain the majority of the weight they've lost if they stop the medication, but we do not know why. It is implied by many who read these studies that, oh, all those people must have gone back to being fat because they're lazy again now and it's not as easy without the drug. But is it actually the case that there are some metabolic issues that these drugs are addressing? So if we stop these medications, of course, people are going to regain weight. Or is it that true fundamental habit change and mentality change is very hard? And that's why only a small number of people are able to keep the weight off because they've done that work. The honest answer is we don't know. The best advice I can offer is really try to change your mentality around food, really try and get the new habits ingrained, maybe stay on the drug for a little while at a certain weight to allow your body to adapt to that weight if you believe in the theory of set points when it comes to weights. And then potentially does weaning down the drug at the end help you to maintain your weight? Maybe, we don't again really know. So there's lots of different things you could potentially try with advice from your healthcare provider, but we actually don't know why some people keep it off and some people don't. I am very keen in this area not to say that it's all down to lifestyle because the more I read around GLP-1s, the more I speak to other people with these experiences and read the studies of what's going on, the more I think they are potentially addressing lots of metabolic issues. And so some people may need the drug long-term in order to keep the weight off. But again, we haven't got the evidence for that. Can you take a GLP-1 if you have an underactive thyroid? The majority of people who just have an underactive thyroid, it shouldn't be a blocker to them having a GLP-1 medication. However, there are going to be exceptions to that. And this is why you need to talk it through with your healthcare worker. For example, people who have an underactive thyroid because they previously had thyroid cancer and had it treated, resulting in an underactive thyroid now, they are not going to be suitable. People who have ongoing thyroid issues may not be suitable. People who have things under investigation like thyroid nodules or are constantly tweaking their doses, again, they might not be suitable. So do have a chat with your healthcare worker. I personally have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune underactive thyroid. And whilst I've been on this medication, what's really important is to keep my thyroid monitored. So every three months I have a blood test and every three months so far, I've needed to reduce my dose because it seems my thyroid is working a little bit better. Again, we don't fully understand why, we know that there are lots of GLP-1 receptors on the thyroid, which is part of the reason we're concerned about things like thyroid cancer. We don't have the evidence to say one way or another with that just yet, but it definitely seems to be affecting some people's thyroids. So if you do have an underactive thyroid, make sure that it's being monitored. Make sure if you go on a GLP-1 that you speak to a clinician, and it will be interesting to see what happens in this area in the next few years. So that is it for today's video. I'll see you guys very soon in my next one.